Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Art really helps us connect with each other. Turtles play an important role in society. I want that to be shown, that there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Today on Spotlight, meet a businesswoman and inventor who's considered one of the first African-American millionaires. Plus, a playable mini golf installation returns why they have a hole featuring chess. And then a local middle school teacher authors his first book about St. Louis teens. But first, a program providing people of all ability levels the opportunity to explore art. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Oh my gosh, it really is gonna look so good once it's all done because then we'll just clamp. Blank Canvas those. Studios provides a warm and a friendly environment where adults aged 21 and older can express themselves through the arts. Yes, we have a music studio with guitars, drums, recording equipment, the performing arts. We have a dance area. We do yoga and meditation, you know, any kind of movement. We're creative everywhere there is to be creative. What are some of the materials you like to work with when you're here at the studio? I like to do my yarn work. Right here I'm making a scarf. Um, I like doing my sticker books. The studio, which was formed in 2009, cultivates artists with developmental disabilities and mental health challenges. And there's a need in our community for day programs, which is something that we do fulfill that need. We just fulfill it in a really unique way. While the studio focuses on life skills, their main concentration is on art and the artists, like Kat, who's been involved in the program for about a year. And this is my boards I've been working on for the art show. I made this birdhouse and this golf club thing. We got a lot going on here. Yeah, I love art. And then come over this way. And then we want your piece and Joey's piece to touch in the back to bring them together. Artist Joey Hoffman has been coming to the studio for more than a decade and can't stress enough the importance for a program like this one. People like us needs to have some place to go. Sounds like a real family environment. It is. It's really nice here. If I'm really upset or something, I can talk to somebody, which is nice to do and good to do, to talk it out and say, hey, I'm just having a rough time. Artist Heidi Stuber has also been in the program for over a decade. Right now, she enjoys painting and making purses. This is one thing I like to do. I like to make purses. So far, one of the highlights of Heidi's time here is when she took a trip to the Big Apple. I got to go to New York. It was a blast. I did a portrait of me, and it sold. So I was happy about that. Even though she's sold one of her paintings, Heidi admits that she still struggles with one thing, learning to draw. I like to step out once in a while out of my comfort zone. And this is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Resources for Human Development is the parent program for Blank Canvas Studios. The nonprofit is funded through the Department of Mental Health. Do you want to show them how you color? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Go ahead and get a pencil and show them how you color. All staff members have some sort of background in the arts, and they love interacting with their students. So um, while we're here spending our days together, we're kind of like developing friendships with them. The one-on-one -on -one attention and a family-friendly atmosphere is why the program sees a very little turnover. But beyond that, there is real talent to see for those who take the time to look. 
To me, one of the coolest things that happens is when we go out in the community for an art show and someone connects with that art, and then they learn that the person has a diagnosis of a disability. And so it's a way to be seen and heard, and it kind of levels things that we can connect with each other where maybe some people don't have the opportunity to know um, individuals with developmental disabilities. And I think art really helps us connect with each other. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hi, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell from the Missouri Historical Society, and this is History Spotlight. Born in 1869 in Metropolis, Illinois, Annie Malone was an American businesswoman, inventor, and philanthropist. She is considered to be one of the first African-American women to become a millionaire in the United States. Public historian Cecily Hunter tells us how she forged this path in St. Louis. So we're here to talk about Annie Turbo Malone. She was born in Metropolis, Illinois to Robert Turbo and Isabella Cook in 1869. She went on to become the self-made millionaire who invented black hair care products to cater to the needs of the market. So she initially started selling her products in Lovejoy, Illinois. When she came to St. Louis to Market Street, she began to expand her business even further. By 1918, she would open the doors to Poro College, serving as a site for black cosmetology and expanding her brand, Poro, the Poro system more broadly, nationally and even internationally. She would have these franchise agents, which served as people who would demo the product going door to door, demoing and showing people how they can continue to build and grow their hair and protect their hair through her hair care line. Annie Malone has been influential because essentially her philanthropic work, her ability to be an inventor, to be able to expand and give back to the community and allow for the community to even grow has been pivotal to the understanding of St. Louis and even the Ville. The Ville served as an up and coming black community in a place where black businesses, where black churches, where black schools and so forth was housed in that particular neighborhood. The Ville was conducive to Poro College's growth because you had different schools, black churches and other institutions there. And so Poro College really served as a place for people to come and to thrive and to be one with community and in community. And so that's why it was so meaningful to have it there in the Ville. This particular building served as a place for black community members. So essentially it was a place for all things you can think of. It had a gentleman's parlor, it had a rooftop garden, it had dormitories, you name it. This was a place where black people would come to build community, to build camaraderie, and to serve as the Mecca essentially in St. Louis. And it became a place where people would go when they couldn't go elsewhere uh, in the city of St. Louis because of segregation and things of that nature. But this became that place where they really invented themselves and did incredible things with what they had and the resources that were provided by Annie Malone. Coral College is right now in the Missouri History Museum within Coloring STL. So if you're interested, we'd love for you to check out the information about Coral College and even do some coloring. Next week on History Spotlight, we take a look at the unique restaurants that were part of the 1904 World's Fair. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Science and history, culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Education, films. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more. See for yourself at hecmedia.org.
We're at the Sheldon Art Galleries for the sixth annual Golf the Galleries exhibit. It's an interactive mini golf exhibit designed by local artists. We bring back Golf the Galleries because it's very popular within the community and we have people coming back every year to play. As you enter the galleries, the first golf hole you'll see is a tour of the factory right behind me by Dave Kish. And it's a factory that creates everything imaginable. And on the walls are items that are made within this factory that Dave has created. And next is Museumception by the City Museum, designed by True Mead and Angelina Brown. You will see items and elements from the museum that are highlighted within this golf hole. And then World Chess Hall of Fame has their golf hole sound moves, which highlights the music themed exhibit that's going on at the World Chess Hall of Fame right now. Then Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by the Lit Shop. It's a golf hole designed by youth ages 10 to 16, featuring imagery from the book and the movie. And then you can play the hole fly fishing by father and son duo Wally and Jacob Houck of Simon Studio. The theme of this golf hole is Missouri fly fishing and it features handmade fishing nets and fishing lures. And next is If You Hit It, It's a Drum by Kelsey and Phil Jordan. This is a music themed hole that actually creates sound if the ball hits areas just right. And the next golf hole has a completely different feel. It's completely black except for areas that are highlighted by black light. And the name of this hole is A Trip to the Moon by Paul Casey and Sarah Frost. And then Anatomy of a House by Silas Cogshell. The golf hole is based on hauntings of a house and what makes a house feel haunted. So it creates an atmosphere of unease. And our ninth and final hole is a day at the dog park by Kelsey and Phil Jordan, which celebrates a dog's favorite outing at the dog park. This exhibit is a great way to interact with art that you typically would not be able to in an art gallery. This is also the fundraiser for the galleries to help with our programming to bring in artist workshops and artist talks. Every year we have thousands of people come and visit this exhibit and I hope you can join us this year. Golf the Galleries runs through August the 6th, and you can find more information at thesheldon.org. After golfing the galleries, head on over to the World Chess Hall of Fame to see the full Sound Moves exhibit. We are celebrating the intersection of chess and music in our newest exhibition, Sound Moves, where music meets chess, here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. This exhibition was co-curated by me and Bradley Bailey, a professor at St. Louis University. This exhibition is very near and dear to our hearts because not only do we celebrate chess and culture here, but we also have a robust music program that started in the first weeks of us opening in 2011. It's not surprising that in some places chess and music intersect. One thing that we love about chess here is that it encompasses all cultures, all languages, all periods of history, and it's really good at storytelling and the exact same thing can be said for music. And so it was so easy to see where these intersected. In the show, we represent how certain chess players were also very prolific musicians, how some of the biggest bands and important music writers were obsessed with chess. And so it's really fun to see some of these celebrities. We've got photos of RZA and the Wu-Tang Clan, the Kid Leroy, Bad Religion, everybody playing chess. Sometimes they're playing behind stage and sometimes it just means so much to them that they use both of these, the chess players and the musicians, as a way to kind of escape. We have something for everybody in this exhibition, from a copy of 13th century manuscripts to number 12 by the artist Guido van der Berg. This is an actual chess piano that makes piano sounds when you press on the keys, which are actually the squares on the chessboard. Also, we have music videos and costumes worn in those music videos from the chess player and musician Huga de Prima. This particular ensemble, the headpiece and shoulder piece, were designed by Diego Montoya, who is known for his incredible work in RuPaul's Drag Race. 
And also we have musical instruments, this incredible bassoon, which was owned by Jacqueline Piatigorsky, who's in the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame, and her family has donated so many incredible objects to our collection. As you can see, we have so many different objects and experiences here where you can see the true connection between music and chess. Throughout the course of the exhibit, we're going to have tons of programming for you to come enjoy. You can see this wonderful exhibit through January 28th, 2024. To learn about it and our other exhibitions and programming, visit our website at www.worldchesshof.org. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. On this episode of Classroom well, Matters, hello, host Christy Hool talks with author and educator Jer Armstead Jones about his first novel, My Invisible Father. It is a story about three St. Louis teens facing the hurdles of adolescence and the impact made by their father's absences. You know, the book is about three teenagers who are searching for their fathers and they have different relationship with their fathers, with one, Jaren being the main character, has absolutely no relationship and doesn't know who his father is. We have another character, Cambry, whose father has been in prison most of her life, and she's pretty upset about that. She wants her father to be a, a part of her life. And then there's Asin, whose father is in the home, but he works, he has his own business, he's bringing a lot of money. Um, but he's not spending a lot of time with his son, Asin, and Asin mm -hmm. is looking for that. Those three stories come in uh, together at the end uh, as you progress in the novel. Tell us a little bit about your background and sort of how this book idea sort of took off for you. The seed of it happened when I was in seventh grade. Um, I At seventh grade in English class, I realized I wanted to be two things, a teacher and a writer. And it was all because of my seventh grade teacher. Like she just made things feel so great, so grand. She was so supportive. Um, and I didn't think I had a, a gift of writing at the time, but she made me feel like I could do it. And then from there, I started trying to just write things as much as I could. Um, I used to watch Cardinal broadcasts or listen to it on the radio back in 82, 83, 84. And after the game, I would write an article. Eventually, I decided I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to get be a sports writer uh, for a newspaper. I ended up doing some of that right after I graduated from Webster University. Um, I worked for the school paper there. And then I just took a hiatus because writing was not providing for my young family at the time. So I just took a hiatus and just ended up doing a bunch of other things. I started working with young people at a juvenile facility. And I saw how so many of them just could not read. Like the, the illiteracy was, you know, eight out of 10 kids could not read. And that really put a burning heart in my desire to want to write for kids. Mm -hmm. So it just pushed me to want to do that, to find something that they can read, that they can relate to, relate to um, especially in the African-American community. So that's kind of how it got birthed in a sense. You do a lot of work with kids. You're working in the school system. You're working in the library system. You've worked in juvenile, you know, uh, correctional facilities. How much of that work sort of impacted this book? Pretty much all of it. I mean, I've, I, it's almost like taking bits and pieces from everywhere I've been. Like, I think it's not by um, accident that I've been in all of those places because it helped groom me and helped show me you know, what our teenagers need. And it gave me, you know, I hate to use the word, but he gave me ammo to you so that I can put it in that book, inside that book and the books that I want to write after this. So mm -hmm. that um, not only can I relate to what they're going through and I've seen it, I've heard it. And then I can kind of piece those things together to help them see that there's a way out of no way. Sometimes there's a way that you can um, escape the problems that you've seen in your family history or in your neighborhood. Um, and I want that to be shown that, you know, there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Now, now you have to choose which way. For the full episode, head to educate.today or wherever you get your podcasts. First person, real world, expert driven. 
That's the focus of the videos, lesson plans, and activity ideas you'll find at our educational website, educate.today. We don't know the mortality rates of box turtles on Missouri roads. What we do know is that box turtles get hammered on roads. That's probably not the first thing people think about when they think of box turtles. Turtles play a very important role in society, in people's psyche. Kids love box turtles. It's a magical moment when a child finds a box turtle. And it's a magical moment for many adults when they find a box turtle. St. Louis University's assistant professor of biology, Stephen Blake, wants people to hold on to those endearing thoughts because he wants them to also think about what's happening to box turtles with sprawling cities and rapidly growing rural communities. Turtles are under significant threat from roads and are likely changing their ranging characteristics dramatically in relation to road infrastructure. And this box turtle safari in Forest Park allows students from schools in the region to understand turtles and study them when the turtles are successfully tracked. We fitted radio telemetry tags to a sample of originally 10 box turtles in Forest Park in different forest fragments and 10 on box turtles at Tyson Research Center. And each VHF, very high frequency radio unit, emits a unique signal. So with a radio receiver, we can follow the movements of each individual turtle. Blake teamed up with Dr. Sharon Deem on the Box Turtle Project. She's director of the St. Louis Zoo Institute for Conservation Medicine. Everyone has a turtle story, right? These little iconic creatures, they really touch our hearts. Here in St. Louis, I haven't met anyone yet who doesn't have a turtle story to share with me. SLU and the St. Louis Zoo are working together to preserve box turtles. They spent years studying box turtle movements. The 11 years we've been chasing little box turtles. During that time, we've looked here in Forest Park of the home range sizes, where these animals are moving, as well as out at Tyson, this contiguous, this wonderful oak hickory forest. And when we find a turtle, we can locate it, actually physically find it. We record a GPS location of where that turtle is. And over time, we can build up a picture of uh, the ranging metrics and movements of all of those turtles. Blake is the lead author and one of the principal investigators, along with Sharon Deem, of a recently published study. Box turtles at Tyson Research Center cover a lot more ground. They have much bigger home ranges than the box turtles in Forest Park. So the turtles that are living in Forest Park are probably those that have learned to have restricted ranges within these small forest fragments. I think the really exciting, unique part of this study is what the team did under Dr. Blake's leadership with looking at Missouri roads, so the road system here in our state, and then doing iterations of placing one of those turtles, Kevin or Kimmy or pick your turtle, placing them on the map and doing their home range and seeing how many times that turtle would cross a road. And we see, even with the turtle with the smallest home range, they will cross a road a number of times each year. In the larger home range, they're always crossing roads. Turtle at Tyson Research Center, if you put that randomly anywhere in Missouri, is going to be crossing roads 100% of the time. The researchers encourage some basic conservation efforts. If we're going to expand urban areas, we need to do it in a way that includes a matrix of wildlife habitat within and around increasing urbanization. We need to think about traffic volume. And there is something everyone can do. If you see a box turtle in the road when you're driving or when you're walking and it's safe to do so, pull over, pick the turtle up. If you pick a turtle up and turn it round and try and get it to go in the wrong direction, it's going to want to go in the direction that it wants to go in. So you should take it to the side of the road in the direction that it's already going, let it go, and you'll reduce the chances of that turtle being killed by traffic enormously. 
You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Have you ever come into the lobby at the fabulous Fox Theater and noticed those mysterious windows near the top? Okay, probably not. It's a long way up there. But once you see what's up there, you might just want to make the climb. Well, here we are in Peacock Alley. You won't find this alley on Google Maps. Most visitors to the Fox don't even know it's here. But up on the fourth floor, in the hallway between the left and right side of the house, is a look at all the shows that have called this place home. And here we are up to 2002 with Mama Mia and the producers. Oh, that was one of my favorite shows. Here's Guys and Dolls, another wonderful show that was in here. Peacock Alley is a year-by-year -year series of collages featuring every show that has played at the Fox since it reopened in 1982. The first show was Barnum. When the Fox opened, Back in January of 1929, Peacock Alley was an art gallery. It was very plain uh, when uh, the Fox reopened, and it remained like that until they made Peacock Alley out of it. The name is a reference to the decorative peacocks you'll find at either end of the hall. And here we have the Righteous Brothers. We have music of the night. To see the names of every show that is played here, you have to read the fine print. If you want to dig into it, yes, but there's enough pictorial there to remind you of a lot of good times without going through that. The shows that have played The Fabulous Fox cover a wide range. Really, just about anything goes. There was Sunset Boulevard, 42nd Street, and Avenue Q, Sinatra Impersonators, and Sinatra in person, Dolly and Hello Dolly. And there's David Copperfield, They've had The Wizard of Oz, The Wiz, and The Miz, Barry Manilow's Copacabana, and Barry Manilow. There's a little something here for everybody. There was Leno and Lena, Showboat and Titanic, Blast and Stomp. Oh, that was a lively show. They have a few more years to go before they run out of wall space there. They've gone around the corner and gone into the elevator lobby. And that is also where you'll find a special tribute to the theater's late great organist, Stan Can. There's even one of his old vacuum cleaners on display. If you don't know why, Google it. So the next time you come to see a show at the Fox, come see the show before the show. You'll probably be reminded of a few you forgot you saw. Think of it as a trip down memory alley. Oh, I think this is great. You know, it's, it's a little history lesson for all of those, both young and old. It's just really a neat place to be. Next week, celebrating lesser known places around our beloved city. Plus inside the unique restaurants from the 1904 World's Fair. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.